Notebook 6. The Accursed War and the Slaughter of September 25. From the 1st of July 1915 to the 27th of September 1915. Part 2. Barthes and his comrades were stationed at the Lorette sector. In 20 days there, accidents and the German artillery had claimed six of the men of the 13th squad making it so that of all the veterans from the original squad, only two, Barthes and the rational Therese, were left. After the last incident in the town of Hersin, which had claimed twelve men from the company, life continued. For the next month and a half, the men were rotated between the towns of Hersin, saint Zangohel, Bouligrené, and the trenches themselves. Gradually, the fighting in the sector calmed down, and the Poilus wouldn't have traded it for any other, for fear of falling into a bad spot. On August 27th, they were in Sanz and Gohel preparing to go to the front line that very evening, when they suddenly received a dramatic counter-order that pulled them out of the Lorette sector altogether to go to an undisclosed part of the front. They left at 2 a.m. and marched for eight hours, being given nothing but a mug of coffee. They passed through the sleeping towns of Hersin and Barlin, and they passed through a village called Menil, which had been completely destroyed by an exploding ammunition dump. They continued walking, passing by other villages, and finally arrived at the town of Camblan Chatelain. Three days later, at noon, they boarded a train with rations for three more days. Still, they had no idea where they were going. The train headed north and at 8 p.m. they disembarked at the station of Berg, six kilometers from Dunkirk. They did not stop at the town and forged ahead in the darkness into an endless plain, the plain of Flanders. They marched and marched. Eventually they passed through a town with a tongue twister of a name which Barthas could not remember. But they did not rest and left the town behind, continuing their march on the vast plains shrouded in darkness. To make things worse, it started to rain. Many soldiers were falling behind, and in the darkness, murmurs and shouts could be heard. The officers said nothing. The men had been given nothing warm to eat or drink since morning, while the officers themselves had had plenty. At the head of the column marched their new commandant, a man called Leblanc, but who had been baptized by the soldiers as Kansgram, half pint. The nickname stuck, and no soldier would ever refer to him as anything else. Kansgram was leading them, but he could not make sense of his map and compass, and had been too proud to ask for directions at the town. As a result, at one in the morning in the middle of a rainstorm, they found themselves at the end of the road they had been following, surrounded by nothing but fields. Kansgram had to admit pitifully, I think that we might be lost. The commandant sent scouts left and right to find a farm where he and his officers could seek refuge. Meanwhile, he granted the Palus the liberty to sleep on the muddy field to await the coming day. Luckily, the Palus discovered a big barn which seemed to have been placed there just for them. It was true that the barn had no walls, being little more than four pillars and a roof but it looked like paradise to them. Nearby there were some haystacks that were pillaged in the blink of an eye, and fifteen minutes later heavy snoring emanated from the barn. Practically the entire battalion camped there, and Barthas wrote that he did not recall sleeping better in his entire life. A while later they were roughly shaken by angry voices. These belonged to the owners of the hay, who were expressing their rightful rage at having their hay stolen. But before their fury, the Paulus simply presented the strength of their inertia. Only a few Parisian Poilus answered to the men with disrespectful wisecracks. Soon after, the livid Commandant Leblanc appeared and forced them to put the hay back in its place. Three hours later, the battalion reached the town of Ostcapel, and the soldiers were lodged in the farms. Barthas's unit was housed in a sheepfold right next to a pig pen, where four or five piglets kept waking them up with their sharp cries. Barthas said that the Reverend Father Gallo, 
a bit less resigned than Job on his donkey, cried out with his hands joined in prayer. Lying on the ground in a sheepfold is nothing. Jesus was born in a stable. But it is this foul odor that makes me sick, and this coating of pig shit slurry spreading all over the floor, turning our straw bed into a stinking manure pile. In fact, after three nights, Barthas couldn't stand the horrible smell and manure either and he went outside and slept under a threshing machine in a barn. The soldiers also suffered from a lack of drinking water. There were frequent torrential rains, but the next day there would be no sign of the rain. There were ponds in the farms, but they were so dirty and polluted that the pigs, cows and horses outright refused to drink from them. All the water to drink and wash themselves had to be brought to the soldiers in kegs. The town of Ostkapel itself was split in two by a road. One half was French and the other half was Belgian. The only difference was that the Belgian side sold huge amounts of cigarettes for ridiculously low prices, which made it a smoker's paradise. Every morning the soldiers also had to carry out elaborate field exercises and long marches. The afternoons were given over to obligatory games of football parallel bars and races, among others. Even the oldest soldiers, the grandfathers of 40, 41 and even 43 years old, joined willingly. Some of the more morose soldiers did not want to play the games, so their new captain, Cro Meireville, made them run wind sprints without taking breaks so that they would appreciate the games. At that time the farmers were harvesting the hops, and one of the soldiers' bosses had the bright idea of issuing a roll call which authorized the Poilus to help the harvest in the afternoon. They would be paid one sou per kilo they collected. The soldiers could only manage to gather about seven or eight kilos each afternoon, and they got small change, but it allowed them to stay away from their captain's clutches. To win favor with the Flemish girls, the younger Poilus posted themselves alongside them, and help them fill their sacks. Bartha said that these young people, carefree as they have always been and always will be, sang, laughed, flirted and embraced, indifferent to the dull roar of cannon fire which sounded over towards Ypres. Barthas, being an old father, went every afternoon to help two old folks whose poverty forced them to come from several kilometers away to make a pretty meager livelihood even counting the few coins which Barthas added to their earnings with his help. One morning after the daily drill, Barthas was stopped by Sub-Lieutenant Malvezi, their section chief. Malvezi, before the war, had been a simple road worker for the tramways. He had not earned his promotion in the battlefield, but in the Narbonne garrison. To fill up vacancies, some sergeants from older conscript classes in the garrisons were being promoted to officers. The higher-ups did not want to promote sergeants from the front because they were too friendly with the enlisted men, and it was feared they would not have enough authority when sending them to the slaughter. Malvezi was not mean-spirited, but he was swollen with pride and got back at the soldiers through little annoyances for any lack of respect they showed him. Malvezi took Barthas a little way off and started reprimanding him. He said that Barthas had been giving anti-militarist ideas to his comrades and complained about how his squad did not march or carry out assault exercises very well. Barthas explained angrily that he always did his duty as corporal and that Malvezi knew well that the soldiers in Barthas' squad were not in good condition. The tailor Mouly was crippled with rheumatism. Pellissier excreted blood every day. Father Gallot had a huge hernia. Therese had asthma. And the old soldier Chapman had a son in the trenches and was going crazy with worry. Barthas would not force them to do more than what they could do, and if they wanted to take his corporal stripes for that they could do so. The stripes meant nothing to him. Malvezi left promising he would talk to the captain about this. It became evident that there was a snitch among the Poilus. The 13th squad suspected a particular sergeant whose name Barthas did not write down, and from that day on 
the sergeant was ostracized by the squad. Despite this confrontation, Malvesi did not show any ill will towards Barthas afterwards, and it seemed he even wanted to remedy things. A few days later, Malvesi went on leave, and surprised Barthas by assigning him as his temporary replacement, giving Barthas command of the section and their billet. During their rest in that part of Belgium, the 280th Regiment received reinforcements from a less battle-tested regiment. Barthas's squad had received two soldiers. Private Chapman, who, as mentioned previously, was an old man who was constantly worrying about his oldest son, who was fighting in the trenches in an assault regiment. And Private Lefebvre, a sailor that would have been a good soldier if not for his weakness to cheap wine. On the 12th of September, they were moved five kilometers to another farm and were assigned to a General Niesel, a warmonger who dreamed only of combats and assaults. Soon after, on the 20th of September, all non-coms and corporals who had been sent for two weeks to train using grenades and other more advanced weapons returned to the company. This meant that their rest time was over. They would soon be sent to battle. The order for departure was set for that very evening at 11 p.m. At assembly, Barthes and his squad noticed that Private Lefebvre was missing. They found him dead drunk behind a pond and had great trouble making him follow them to the town of Berg, where they would embark for their unknown destination. The soldiers arrived at Berg at 1 a.m. and were ordered to stay in the street and not wander off because they would leave at any minute. The soldiers stayed on the street for hours, exposed to the cold as white sleet fell. The train only arrived at 7 a.m. They had been ordered to leave eight hours early to catch a train that was barely six kilometers away. The soldiers embarked and the train departed. As they passed the town in their journey by train, they heard a hellish cannonade. They were told that those were British armored trains, firing on towns held by the Germans. At 11 a.m., the train stopped at St. Paul, and they had to immediately march away under the rain to reach the small village of Equadre later that afternoon. Barthas' section was housed in a dark, cramped and filthy structure. In front of them were three pig pens, the ones to the sides with pigs, the one in the middle empty. Barthas slept in that middle pen together with a comrade, and they did not do too bad despite the grunts of their neighbors and the huge rats that ate the contents of their bags during the night. The owners of the farms also treated the soldiers poorly and did not let them use the pumps at the well, which made it difficult for them to get water to drink and to shave with. On September 23rd, the regiment was assembled, and their Colonel Pujal announced what they all knew. A general offensive was going to be unleashed. He said that at this moment the Russians were falling back in the east, but that while the Germans were distracted, the French would destroy them on this front. The colonel cried out, And now, forward! No more hernias, no more weak hearts, no more aches and pains, nothing but the will to win. Vive la France! His patriotic nonsense did not arouse the slightest enthusiasm. Everyone remembered all too well the horrors of Lorette and the colonel's final words were greeted by a terrible silence. The next night, at 3 a.m., and under rainy weather, they left the Quavre in the direction of Arras. At one in the afternoon, the regiment made camp in the small village of Habarque. The streets were full of tired soldiers. They could hear a violent cannonade all along the front. The weight of fire was such that it was impossible to detect individual cannons fired. It was more of an uninterrupted roar. The corporals were called to the company office. How many men in your squad? The officer there asked Barthas. Fourteen, chief, replied Barthas. Well, here, take these fourteen cutlasses. Give one of them to each man, said the officer. These are arms for murderers, not for soldiers, exclaimed Barthas. It matters little to me replied the officer as he pushed Barthas out of the door, and keep your opinions to yourself. 
But Barthas did not keep his opinions to himself, and explained to his comrades what these cutlasses were for, just as had been clearly explained elsewhere. They were for finishing off the wounded and for killing prisoners. Well, he said to his squad, my cutlass will not be used for such crimes, and in front of his men he threw the weapon up onto the roof of a nearby house. Almost everyone got rid of their cutlasses, and no one asked what happened to them. Only Sublutant Malvezi took the biggest cutlass he could find and showed it off proudly on his belt. Before supper, their officers were ordered to stuff the soldiers' heads with how an incalculable amount of cannons were pounding the entire German front. They said that all the French, Belgian and English troops would rise at the same time and would scatter the few miserable Boches who had survived the artillery. Their division would not have the honor of being in the first wave. Their role was to pursue and capture the fleeing enemy. Their superiors were absolutely certain that this time open field warfare would begin again. They were so sure of it that they gave the soldiers white squares of cloth to attach to their packs so that their artillery and airplanes could recognize them from afar. In short, they all said that it would be a walk in the park. Then came the distributions of grenades, ammunition, rations, tools and sandbags. At ten in the evening they were stuffing their packs with all this material, and at one in the morning their 280th regiment headed off for the trenches in complete silence. Everyone was thinking about the horrors and suffering they would have to go through, either again or for the first time. Two hours later they crossed the half-demolished town of Maruil and the river Scarp. They stopped here near a blasted factory and were ordered not to leave their groups or dismount their equipment. They said that their dash in pursuit of the enemy was imminent. Dawn rose, and it was the fateful day, 25th of September. A gigantic battle would begin across the entire front, with hundreds of thousands fighting and dying. Thousands of cannons had been firing at the Germans without stop for three days, and now, in the final hours before the attack, the bombardment reached its climax, making the earth tremble and filling the soldiers' hearts with terror. Heavy rain fell intermittently, but the Poilus had no protection. There were a few fine shelters in the village, but they were only for the officers. Right behind them, on the other side of the river, an armored train armed with naval guns started firing at daybreak with clockwork regularity. Each time it fired its monstrous guns, the very air shook, and the shockwave made the soldiers feel that their guts and brains were going to burst. They started receiving encouraging news about advances by the English to their left and the French forces in front of them. It seemed that the first enemy line had been quickly captured, and soon after, at noon, a whistle pierced the air, signaling that it was their division's turn to advance. They left the village and near the cemetery entered a communication trench that was full of recent shell craters. The ground was covered with busted canteens, shredded packs and broken and twisted rifles. This did not improve their pessimism. The soldiers marched carefully and silently, with their heads down. The bombardment across the front grew in violence, while murderous machine guns fired non-stop. Ahead of them, the momentum of the French troops was stopped by the fierce resistance of the Germans. General Niesel decided that the only way to make the Germans flee their trenches was by terrifying them with a human wave. So, he gave the order for the entire division to climb out of the trenches and march over open country. It was a forest of bayonets, and even the division's cavalry squadron charged forward but it did no good. The Germans stood their ground and fought desperately. Some time-fused shells started to explode over the Poilus' heads, making them crouch in the communication trenches without waiting for the authorization by their idiotic general. Their superiors made the regiment stop and dig in at an old abandoned trench. It turned out this trench was historic. 
it had once been the German front line during the May offensive. No one knew how long they would have to stay there, whether an hour or days. General Niesel then gave a terrible order for the rear echelon personnel. Orderlies, cooks, rationers and all others received the order to rejoin their units at the trench. This was how the 13th squad was reinforced with the Pérouessa François Maisonneuve, who had the duties of assistant cook and rationer at the officers' mess. Niesel wanted everyone to get a share of the glory, but Bartha saw only terror in the faces of these men, who would have preferred a thousand times to stay with their pots and pans far behind the lines. Night came, and with it a cold and torrential rain that lasted its entirety. The soldiers were so exhausted and demoralized that no one complained. They simply stood there under the rain, passive and indifferent like beasts of burden. Bartha talked with Father Galo, who fumbled with his rosary in his frostbitten fingers. The priest told him he was offering his sufferings to God in penitence for the expiation of his sins, and he was certain this would shorten his time in purgatory. The man almost seemed happy with his suffering. Barthas envied him. He doubted that there was some invisible being in that night tallying up their sufferings for their afterlife. Then Barthas turned to Lefebvre, and he envied him too. The sailor had drunk an entire bottle of cheap wine, and he was snoring in the sleep of drunkenness. Nearby, Private Chapman was sobbing. He only thought about his son, who was in the attack at Champagne, and wondered whether he was alive, wounded, or dead. Barthas tried to comfort him, but the man did not even hear him. And, slumped in the communication trench, was poor Private Pellissier. He was small, sickly, and scrawny. A human crack, he did not even have the strength to speak. The Pelia Swan Maisonave did nothing but rage all night long against the general for making him come to the front. The other rear personnel did not dare to complain, knowing what the veterans had suffered in the trenches during the winter. Only the rationer Therese slept. Behind them a battery of heavy artillery pieces fired all night long, but Therese had the rare power to sleep anywhere, no matter the circumstances. Eventually the soldiers got used to the noise of the artillery, but still the lightning flashes from the cannon's mouths kept them awake. At 1 a.m. the rationers were sent to the field kitchens to get their supper, but in the darkness the cooks and the rationers looked blindly for one another. This made it so the men with food did not arrive until just before dawn, soaked in rain and sweat. The rain had turned the loaves of bread into mud, and the coffee was ice cold. It was very little comfort after their uncomfortable night. The morning of the 26th was rainy, but at noon the weather improved, so the fighting intensified again. The soldiers prepared their packs and waited for orders. At 4 p.m. they had a visit from Commandant Kansgram, his follower, the Captain Adjutant Major Cromereville, and the battalions adjutant the Pérouessa François Calvet. Their uniforms were dry and spotless, and except for the non-coms, no one saluted them. Calvet stopped to give Barthas a handshake, but they were interrupted by an orderly with a dispatch in his hand, who was looking for the commandant. They shuddered. This piece of paper could determine their fate. The commandant read the dispatch in a loud voice, and Barthas could hear some significant parts. Our troops have taken the trench of Letilleux. The 280th Regiment will take the communication trench at La Targette. The attack on Farabou will be pushed to the limit. Pushed to the limit meant one thing. Take this objective no matter the cost and pay no attention to losses. General Niesel was doing a fine job sending his men to the killing fields. A quarter of an hour later, the 280th Regiment made its way through the communication trenches to the front lines. They passed the ruined village of La Targette, and then got lost in a web of trenches, unable to find the right path. 
they occasionally found some men isolated or in groups heading towards the rear. They looked half crazy. Most gave no answers to their questions. Others only exclaimed, The poor guys! The poor guys! Or, It's horrible! Frightful! Nobody had heard anything about Farbu, their objective. Some thought that perhaps it only existed in the imagination of the general. Soon, whole battalions and companies were getting mixed up in the confusion, and the regiment did not reach the front lines until one in the morning. The soldiers fell down in fatigue, and most immediately went to sleep. They had been carrying their packs for nine hours. In the night, Barthas heard the voice of Colonel Pujal, barely twenty steps away. He was talking with another colonel. He heard Pujal cry out, Nevertheless, I have a direct order from General Niesel to attack Farbu tonight. But that's insane, exclaimed the other colonel. Our division has been wiped out without taking the second German line, and you're planning to go take Farbu somewhere out there, who knows where? The best thing for you to do would be to fall back on Neuville saint vaast about 1,500 meters from here. It turned out that General Niesel was sending his regiments out in night so dark they could not see a cow two paces away to attack a village in the rear of the enemy lines. It was difficult to determine whether they were in the hands of an imbecile or a dangerous madman. In the end, the regiment did fall back on Neuville saint vaast where they arrived at dawn. They had been slogging through the muddy, flooded trenches since four o'clock the previous afternoon. It had taken them fourteen hours to reach a place that, if they had walked in a straight line, would have taken them an hour and a half. And on this note ends the sixth notebook, with Barthes and his comrades being sent to a completely different sector, leaving Lorette behind only to fight now in a new general offensive against the German lines. Their commanders, including General Niesel, seem to be completely disconnected with the reality of the war and the reality of the soldiers. Sometimes incompetence seems to be responsible for far too many deaths. We will see how this situation evolves in the seventh notebook. I hope you all stay well until then, and I'll see you next time.